good evening and very warm welcome today uh, the much awaited lecture series uh, dr arul sangvi endowment ama uh, lecture series this is the 16th lecture and uh, every year we have this uh, dr arul sangvi from hl college he retired and shared some of his graduate amount to ama with his uh, wish that every year there must be one uh, lecture should be done on national scale uh, in the subject of economics and uh, every year uh, we are uh, very happy to mention that we are privileged to have the best speakers of india including uh, all most of the uh, governors of uh, rbi uh, dr manmohan singh also uh, montek singh aluwale also and uh, today we have one more legendary with us uh, uh, dr krishna murthy subramaniam he is the uh, everybody knows that chief economic advisor of the government of india and uh, he is going to speak to us about a very good subject very very positive aspects of our country we are talking of 5 trillion economy and the road map to that uh, dr subramaniam is uh, having all the top degrees of the world Uh, he is holding master of business administration and doctor of philosophy uh, in financial economics uh, from booth school of business university of chicago he is also alumnus of indian institute of technology kanpur uh, where he did electrical engineering he is also alumnus of indian in institute of management kolkata so where he was uh, awarded uh, the aving marion uh, foundation uh, dissertation fellowship in 2005 dr subramaniam has uh, worked with a lot of important places and uh, uh, committees and uh, uh, policy making he has worked with uh, uh, sebi he has worked with reserve bank of india he was part of major economic and corporate reforms in india and has worked with uh, jp morgan chase icici bank tata consultancy services he is board member of uh, bandhan bank he is board member of the national institute of bank management and uh, the reserve bank of india academy he is uh, been uh, the finance faculty at uh, uh, emory university in the united states and also now uh, uh, having close relations with uh, in, in school of business it will go on and on and on but uh, uh, today we are all here to hear him on his subject and his knowledge so i will not go further and on behalf of all of us uh, uh, i will welcome him with a bouquet of flower we are also having a very special guest today with us uh, uh, mr uh, marotra he is the chief commissioner income tax gujarat and uh, uh, it's a very good coincidence that he uh, is uh, here and two days ago they had a uh, income tax day celebration and uh, they did it a uh, very well uh, i was there and uh, 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 chief minister ubani saab and a lot of other dignitaries the collectors and the uh, ministers were there and uh, uh, they celebrated it very well uh, and uh, i'm very happy that he is here at ama and uh, we at that point of time also talk to him and uh, told him that we will organize a separate session with him but today since he is here uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to felicitate him with a bouquet of flower on behalf of all of us here in fact uh, without waiting further i will request uh, dr subramaniam to uh, address us yeah uh, i would request uh, uh, mr merotra uh, you can also uh, give a welcome speech because you are also a part co-host for with us today uh, for mr subramaniam and after that uh, uh, he will start
Dr. Subramaniam, the dignitaries on the dais, and the, uh, the honorable members of AMA and um, the uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's uh, I think, a surprise that I have been asked to speak. Actually, let me tell you the truth. I just buzzed in. Uh, I saw in the newspaper today the advertisement, and uh, we rarely get chance to hear the chief economic advisor of government of India. So I requested AMA that please allow us to come in and we'll also bring some of our officers and many commissioners and additional commissioners are in the audience. So it's a, it's a privilege for this city that we are able to hear such a renowned person on this annual lecture series. And um, the, this year's economic survey and budget, they lay out a vision for a five trillion dollar economy. So the finance minister has given 10 points agenda that what is the vision for the decade. But I'll not give the details, we'll hear from the expert. And uh, I, I have studied, sir, a bit of economics I, from Birmingham University in UK. Government had sent me. So I was very keen to listen to you. So we, I'll not stand between you and the audience. I welcome you here and uh, look forward to your interesting lecture. Thank you. Mr. Mehta, President AMA, <coughs> Mr. Marotra, little bit of economics is too humble for you when you've learned it from Birmingham University. <laughs> Other dignitaries in the dais, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, and ladies and gentlemen. First, let me acknowledge that I feel extremely humbled by the description that was given. Um, I've always believed that there is that <clears throat> there's a lot of grace involved in whatever one one gets to contribute, and I attribute these to just just the grace, blessings of parents, and the, and the grace of God. <clears throat> Similarly, so we hope that the same grace of the Lord also is there as we set out on this goal to achieve the five trillion dollar economy. Um, the Honorable Prime Minister has set out that vision and the economic survey therefore um, has made an earnest attempt to try and create that strategic blueprint. I just want to, before I get into you know, talking about the blueprint, I was just want to point out whether or not this goal is, you know, is how realistic or ambitious is this goal? Just to you know, put some numbers in perspective. So for India to become a, you know, a one trillion dollar economy, so the first trillion dollars, <clears throat> it took us 55 years. And if you convert it into in rupee terms, during that first 55 years, the av on average, the currency was about, you know, can, I mean, the currency moved a lot, but just take it as 10 on average, you know. Um, so which means, and you know, w one trillion is basically one lakh crores, and so if you convert it into, into rupees, that's 10 lakh crores. So in 55 years, we basically, our GDP grew by 10 lakh crores. <clears throat> in contrast, from 2014 to 2019, the GDP grew from 1.7 trillion to 2.7 trillion dollars. So we added the same 1 trillion dollars. But now remember that during this period, the currency, the conversion was, you know, on average, take it as about 65 rupees to the dollar, which means that 1 trillion dollars is now equivalent to 65 lakh crores. So just sort of do, a, do this comparison, you know, 10 lakh crores in 55 years and 65 lakh crores in five years. 
that I think tells you that you know when we can create almost six and a half times you know of, of the GDP in one eleventh of the time period, then why can't we aspire to actually go from you know three trillion dollars, which we are going to be this year, to five trillion dollars? And that's why this is a, a goal that is definitely achievable. Um, it is little bit of a you know of 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 um, th there is ambition involved in that goal which is good you know one of my and there are many many um, learned people from management side who are also here who would acknowledge that one of the key theories if you look at theories of motivation when the goal is something that is just maybe 10 to 15 percent of a stretch that is the sweet spot because um, on the one hand, it, if the goal is too easy, then then again, you know, it, you don't feel motivated. But if the goal is too hard, then also, you know, people sort of tend to tend to give up. So that 10 to 15 percent of an, of ambition is what creates that 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 you know sweet spot in terms of the stretch. And that's why I think this is something which is uh, eminently achievable, uh, especially under the leadership of of uh, uh, the current prime minister, honourable prime minister. Um, so, given that goal that has been you know set out, um, we need to grow at eight percent approximately, you know, uh, in in real terms if we have to achieve that goal, and and that's what this this sort of the economic survey has tried to do. And I'll use this parallel um, to try and explain the the sort of the, the big picture idea in some sense. Um, so all of us would have played with with frisbees when we were young. Right? How many of you played with frisbees when you were young? Many of you. Okay. So suppose I actually throw this frisbee. Does the frisbee run in this in a, in one same direction? No. Right? As the wind comes, actually sometimes it it you know it gyrates, goes one direction, another. It basically goes up, down, and lots of, and and that is a metaphor that I think about. You know the way in a globalized economy where you know which is integrate indian economy integrated with that there will be uncertainties right um, now if my goal is to go and catch that frisbee then i you know if i throw the frisbee in this direction i cannot be running in that direction right i have to run in this direction and that is sort of so think about catching the frisbee as the equivalent of the goal of the 5 trillion dollar economy the direction in which i have to run is basically the blueprint but what is important also is that if I just start running in the direction of the frisbee, but do not keep my eyes on the frisbee, then again I will not be able to catch because I have to recalibrate as the as as the frisbee sort of gyrates in the, in the wind, which is what is important actually. That's why you know um, continuous recalibration in an economy that is that is un, you know that is exposed to significant uncertainties. That is what is the reality in a globalized world. Is, is important. So recalibrating using several tools, tactical tools, is also important if you have to achieve this, this objective. And that's what the survey tries to do, which is lay out the blueprint, which is the direction in which we have to go, and what are the tools that we must be using in order to recalibrate continuously to be able to achieve that. That's what the, the, the so economic survey is about. And we chose the color of the survey to be sky blue to try and capture what is called blue sky thinking and the idea behind that blue sky thinking is you know just imagine maybe you know today evening or whenever you get a chance lie on the grass and just look at look at the blue sky you know it, that's a mindset in which when you are gazing at that you know and at the blue sky you are thinking in an unconstrained manner whatever bounds are there and oftentimes most of the bounds are there in our minds um, when you are gazing at that blue sky, you actually are thinking about big things without, you know, without without constraints. That's what the blue sky thinking captures. And what we've made an attempt here is to try and sort of indulge in that unfettered, you know, uh, sort of unconstrained thinking to be able to create this blueprint for the for the five trillion dollar economy. That's why the 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 the, the blue sky uh, is cover. The other other uh, aspect that you would notice is you actually see these gears connected, interconnected gears um, moving together, and that is an important aspect which I'll come to you know as as I as I go through what are the key ideas here. Um, so this is basically the that's a sky blue cover, um, 
as you would notice the you know this is a hashtag that's been trending economy at five trillion dollars um, and um, this is this is something this hashtag is something I learned from my daughter um, you know the the, the, the a young population is actually, you know, is the one that is the cool, cool one, right? And so they uh, end up teaching us things that make, possibly make us look a little bit cool. We can never be, of course, as cool as them. Um, so that's the, that's the key objective, economy at $5 trillion. Um, the idea is to create a virtuous cycle, and I'll explain what I mean by this, um, by, by this virtuous cycle just in a minute. Um, by by investment so investment driven virtuous cycle and that's why you will notice here investment is sort of be shown in a big big gear the once you drive investment the other gears basically start moving on their own and that's what i'm going to emphasize in a minute that's why this idea of actually interlinked gears which you know with, with the five trillion dollar economy as the sort of the centerpiece of that uh, <clears throat> so this is sort of the you know, volume one is what lays out the blueprint for the, you know, for, for this $5 trillion economy. Volume two, <coughs> uh, you know, describes what has happened over the last year uh, in, in the economy. So this is just a quick recap of what, you know, has happened in the last five years. Um, we've grown at, you know, India has been a sweet spot in the economy, um, um, in the global economy. We've grown at close to 7% on average. Um, and this is a good point, you know, for me to also just quickly um, uh, address any concerns about about growth rates. You might you might have been reading in the newspapers, you know, some debates about the GDP data, etc. Um, while while I can go, at, you know, at length speak for 15, 20 minutes just on that issue itself. Um, what I can, you know, assure you is having seen from very close quarters over the last six, seven months. Um, one thing that is very difficult in a democracy like India is to create a narrative that is different from the truth. Um, because there are so many touch points for policy, somebody will basically squeal and say that, you know, this is the truth, if, if, you, if there is an attempt to create a narrative that is different from the truth. The other important point to remember is that if you, if you recall our, the, the quarter, f you know, Q4 growth has been actually a little lower. We, you know, we grew at 5.8%. So if there was any attempt to try and actually, you know, sort of um, use the GDP numbers to portray a higher rate, then the incentive would have been the maximum to do that when the growth rate is lower. And so, so either, either the GDP numbers are, are you know, are, are sort of are, are precise, reasonably, and of course we can have debate about, you know, about those issues, or we basically, you know, are, are not having a slowdown. You can't have, have, have both of them together. And that's sort of the important point to remember in terms of, so given that particular sort of a footnote comment, we are, we have been growing, we've been a sweet spot in the economy, um, we've been a, uh, <clears throat> compared to the emerging markets and the world, we've actually been doing much better. Um, inflation has been controlled, I think this is a key, um, achievement that has happened and inflation especially matters because inflation is a pernicious tax on the on on on, on the poor um, why because think about you know w what does inflation do and the best way to think about it is actually take a thali you know any th you know any thali right um, today if i actually paid 100 rupees for it if the rate of inflation is 10 percent then you know one year from now i will have to pay 110 rupees for that same thali now for people, for most of us in the room here, you know, our, uh, what our dearness allowance or our increment, salary increments, generally keep pace with inflation. Um, but for, you know, for, for poorer people, that, that person who comes basically, you know, maybe works in a house or other, um, you know, other people, typically the raise, salary raises are not commensurate with inflation. Um, and, and, and so, you know, if inflation, if basically is inflation is at 10%, their salary raises are not to the extent of inflation, then the effective purchasing power they have, the ability to buy that thali goes down significantly. And that is why, you know, inflation is a pernicious tax on the poor. Um, and in that context, therefore, reducing inflation to, to, to 4%, I think, you know, has been a, has been a major, major, um, you know, achievement over the last uh, five years. Uh, what it also does, and, and this is sort of a more technical point, that um, inflation is also affected by expectations of future inflation. 
which itself has also been, you know, been been conquered um, by the by the by the um, performance over the last five years. Um, overall, and if you look at what else has happened, I think macro macroeconomic stability, which I've already touched upon, uh, with, you know, sixth largest economy now, average inflation has been down by, by less than half. Um, gross fiscal deficit is about, you know, has decreased from 4.5% in 2013-14 to 3.4% as of 2018-19 and is budgeted for 3.3% for, for, you know, in the, in the coming year. So this is something which is clearly a, 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 a you know, a, an important achievement. Um, if you look at in terms of infrastructure, there's been significant, you know, uh, in uh, improvement in village electrification, in national highways, in, in, the, in the Udan scheme. Um, there's been the framework for corporate exits that's been created, I think, is a very important, uh, you know, measure because um, without the, the threat of, of losing control over your company, um, the, 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 the sort of the, the deterrent effect was not there and that would sort of, as a result of which, a large proportion of the NPAs that got created also was because this deterrent was not there. And creation of that deterrent, you know, I think, generally promo what promoters worry most about is the, the, the fear of losing the company, losing control over the company, which is something that the IBC, the bankruptcy code has created, and thereby um, you know, encourages good borrowers, those borrowers who are actually willing to repay, and, and sort of discourages um, you know, behavior that, that, uh, that, that basically uh, what that was exhibited in sort of in during the during the creation of the NPS. Um, there's been I think the pathways for trickle down through the Aadhaar, through the um, the Jandhan Yojana, Yojana Jandhan accounts, um, the direct benefit transfers, and I think you know when when political scientists will be will be writing their verdict on the on the recent national election, they will definitely be focusing on on this part, the fact that the trickle down actually welfare programs reaching the poor, I think made a big difference in the, um, and finally, I think f federalism has really been, been, been institutionalized um, through, by, by, by increasing the state's share from 32% to 42%, the GST co council actually, I think is a brilliant example of that. Um, so that's what, you know, sort of a quick review of what has happened in the last five years, which then positions me to talk about what we, you know, what we are basically setting out to do in the next five years. Um, which is shifting gears, private investment as the key driver of growth, jobs, exports, and demand. Um, so the essence of the idea in, you know, for which, is, which is in this blueprint is captured in this one slide. And therefore, you know, I want to spend some time on, 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 on explaining this slide. What you, so what you see in the middle here is this virtuous cycle, and I, that's what I want to explain. <clears throat> So the, the first step in that is investment and saving. That investment, especially you know, in, by, by, by the private sector, um, investment, which itself requires saving as well. But the first step is investment. Investment enhances productivity. I think for a lot of us, it is obvious. But, but still, let me actually use a simple example to convey. So all of us have these, this phone. Each of us carries a phone like this. It's, it's an investment of maybe 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, depending on the quality of the phone. What does the smartphone really do? It actually makes us more productive. You know, if we, we can use, for instance, I use it many times when I get some thoughts, ideas, I use notes to just go and put it there and down directly. Uh, if I, you know, I can use voice memos, I can WhatsApp with my, you know, with everybody. I can actually send videos to people. So many things I can do in just with one investment, which is basically in this particular phone. Good example of, of investment enhancing productivity. In fact, you know, if you take the investment that you are making to be here and maybe listen to some boring economics for one hour itself is an investment which will hopefully you know make you productive as well which is true for with all education education itself is an investment that enhances productivity so investment what is true for individuals is also true at the at the economy the macro economy le level as well that investment enhances productivity and productivity leads then to exports and jobs, and I'm going to I'm going to show you evidence on each one of this because one of the key things that a survey and economic, what distinguishes a survey economic survey from let's say other documents is that economic survey is not about opinion; it's about evidence-driven, you know, um, ideas. And so I'm going to give you an example, but let's first understand intuitively why productivity is important for exports. Um, again, let's meet, let me take this example. 
So this phone, you know, most likely was manufactured in China, you know, put together in China, right? Um, or, or maybe another, another economy. So it's sort of an, you know, it's an imported one, right? And why did I buy this? Because I actually got a good quality device at a low price. So as a consumer, I buy something which is imported if it is available at a lower price for the same quality when I have two goods. Or, you know, if I actually get a better quality good at the same price, then I actually go and buy an imported good instead of a domestic product. The same psyche works very well for consumers abroad as well. When will they, when will they go buy a good that is, that is exported? When they actually get the same quality good at a, at a little bit of a lower price or at the same price for a, for a higher quality which then gets to productivity. What is productivity effectively? It's basically the ratio of, of output to input, you know. So in order for exports to go up, our firms have to be productive. Without them being productive, they cannot compete in international markets because in international markets, there is, you know, it's, it, the, uh, it's, it's a very competitive one and it's only on the quality of your product or the price that you pay for that, that, for that product. That's only that, that uh, you know, enables you to compete in international markets. So productivity is a crucial you know, gear in this particular virtue cycle because investment that leads to productivity then encourages exports. Investment also creates jobs and this is oftentimes not as obvious. You know, in, intuitively, when many of us think, we will, you know, we may think that actually investment, particularly capital investment, let's say capital intensive investment, you know, robs, robs jobs or actually takes away jobs. That's sort of the intuition we have. And the evidence though is, is, is you know, um, actually that investment creates jobs. And I'll take a simple example. So, you know, many of us would, would remember how the the tellers in the banks were replaced by ATM machines. So if you look at it in that partial sense, then you would say, oh, look, the you know, investment, capital investment in ATMs actually destroyed the job of the teller. So investment reduces jobs is the, is the perception that would, we would create. But the, you know, the, sort of the, the incompleteness in that argument is that we are not looking at the entire value chain. If you take into account that in order to manufacture that, that ATM machine, first some, some scientists had to do research and develop that. Not only that, after the research and development, it had to be commercialized, it had to be manufactured. So somebody, some workers in the factory you know, that manufactures ATM machines got jobs because they were manufacturing it. You know. uh, not only that, once it was manufactured, it, once it's you know, set up, you need people who actually bring in cash, right? There are these security guards and others who bring in cash. You know, you t when you take all that into account, then we take the full value chain of a particular you know, pr product or activity into account, actually investment creates jobs. And this has been seen historically, you know, starting from the, you know, you know, from, from the Second World War, when the advanced economies, after they were reduced to a rubble, you know, after the World War, they grew on the basis of investment. And that created significant jobs as well. If jobs were not created, there would have been, you know, there would have been riots there actually. And I think China is now the best example of, it has grown at close to 10% and has created millions of jobs in that process. And I'm gonna just show you some evidence on, you know, the investment rates that have prevailed in China. So investment creates jobs. So these investment actually leading to productivity, which creates, ex, you know, enhances exports and jobs is important because when you have exports and jobs, those people, those exporters and the workers then have purchasing power to actually demand goods and services. And that in increase in demand for goods and services, anticipating that demand, companies invest more because say now the demand is building up, I need to invest more to actually cater to that demand. That's how this virtuous cycle really builds up and, and you know, animal spirits get fed further and further. This is the virtuous cycle that we need to really get, you know, need to sort of make it uh, go, go faster uh, in order to be able to grow at, at, at 8%. Um, and, and that is the important distinction that, you know, we've made in the survey. On the flip side, if you take what happened during the global financial crisis um, in the, um, you know, in, in the, um, it ha happened in the global financial crisis in the advanced economies, what happened was it's actually this, it was a vicious cycle, just the reverse. 
people lost their jobs because people lost their jobs the demand for goods and services came down anticipating lower demand companies invested less and because they invested less they again retrenched more people and that's how the vicious cycle operated and this is very important to recognize that economies that are doing well are on a virtuous cycle and those that actually are not doing well during that period they are you know in a vicious cycle this is the key departure that we need to sort of recognize and therefore investment becomes by far the most critical in order for us to be able to grow at that 8% create enough jobs create you know have exports as well um, you know in 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 this process so now let me give you so i've outlined this virtuous cycle but i'm going to show you some evidence now supporting that um, if you go and take a look at the first chapter of the survey, um, there's evidence provided not only from China, but also from other East Asian economies, Indonesia, Thailand, Korea, Malaysia, etc. Uh, but in the interest of the presentation, I'm going to only show you the evidence from China. But you can go and look at actually that the evidence is more broader, is broader, um, you know, from the... So this chart, I think, is very, very informative. This is for China. So... Since the 1980s, China has grown at very high rates. China has grown at very high rates, you know, close to 10%. But notice something that, you know, that oftentimes does not get as much attention. That line is, the is basically the ratio of consumption to GDP. In other words, out of 100 yuan, how much did the Chinese consume, and how much did they save, and how much did they invest? So the red line is consumption, the blue line is savings, savings rate, and the green line is investment. Notice that the consumption actually kept coming down systematically as the Chinese economy actually you know, grew, grew further and further, and investment and savings increased significantly. This is a crucial aspect that we have to focus on because, you know, many times by looking at the Western economies, we say, oh, it's consumption that has to drive economic growth. Consumption can be a, it can be a second order multiplier. It can actually be a, you know, a, sort of a multiplying force. But the key thing has to be investment. You know, investment has to be the key driver. And that is something that we learn from by, by looking at this particular chart. I'll show, it, show the same thing to you in a different way. So here I showed it using calendar time. Same thing, look at it in terms of development, you know, how developed China was becoming. So on the x-axis now is GDP per capita. Uh, for those of you who are more mathematically inclined, it's, it's, a, it's the log, log to the base 10. So this three is basically $1,000 in, in GDP per capita. But, you know, let's not get into those sort of details here. GDP per capita, which means as you go more on to the, to the right here, what is happening is the Chinese economy is, is becoming more and more developed. You know, GDP per capita is increasing. What do you notice here? That as the economy started growing and becoming more developed, the Chinese economy invested a lot more. Okay, this is the, what is called the gross capital formation. It invested most. In other words, the economy is, is doing better, but China is pouring more of its, you know, of, of its GDP into investment. It's saving more, savings is required. If you have to invest, you have to save. Much like an, you know, in a, for a household as well. If we have to go and invest in a car, for instance, we cannot basically be consuming more. We have to go and save more. So it was saving more and investing more and exporting a lot. Why is this important? Because if they, if consumption, domestic consumption is not going to drive this as much because people are saving, then the consumption has to happen in foreign markets, which is where exports comes in. Because if you think about it, you know, consumption can come either from domestic markets or can come from global markets. When you sell to global markets, you're exporting. And when you actually are consuming inside, you, that's basically domestic consumption. The economy was saving a lot more, which means that consumption was coming down consumption was coming down now if domestic consumption is coming down the companies in china were producing for whom they were producing for the world markets they basically were and this is a critical part therefore that you know in a wish in a virtuous cycle the exports bit is really important so not domestic consumption but foreign consumption producing goods for 
you know, for obviously some part of the domestic com economy, but producing for the foreign economy exports is really critical. No country has been able to grow sustain in a sustained manner for, you know, at, at high growth rates without being able to actually drive its exports significantly, which is its itself related to the, ex the productivity bit, which I mentioned. If our, our exports have to go up, you know, they, it cannot be done via palliatives. It has to be that our firms have to become more productive. And I'll come to that, you know, in, 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 in some time. So this is really sort of, you know, important to keep in mind. Some more evidence. Now, I, I'm claiming that, that investment increases exports. What is the evidence for that? So that evidence is being shown here in two sets of graphs which is the, on the left one, you have investment, increase in investment on the, on the x-axis, and you have productivity on the y-axis. Now, even if you take out that blue line, so just think, just do that visual exercise, think about those dots without the blue line. What do you observe? A set of dots that are basically increasing, and that blue line is just provided, just fitting a line through it. It's very clear from here that as investment increases, productivity increases. And to the right, what is being shown is, here you have x-axis productivity increases, and on the y-axis, increase in exports. So investment increases productivity, and increase in productivity then increases exports, which is the, which is the part that I actually described here in this virtuous cycle. Increase in investment increases productivity, increase in productivity then increases exports. And this is the crucial part of this virtuous cycle that unless you have incre improvements in productivity through increases in investments, you can't have exports actually happening at a, at a high rate. And this is the, the uh, a second piece of evidence if you see here, right, I'm saying investment creates jobs as well. So let me provide you evidence for that too. This is a chart showing investment on the x-axis and unemployment rate on the y-axis for the entire economy, which is, so I'm not looking at only ATM, ATMs replacing tellers. I'm looking at the entire set, unemployment rate in the economy. What you notice, again, you take out that blue line, just look at that set of data points, you'll see the basically downward sloping, which says that as investment increases in the economy, unemployment rate decreases. And, and that is the other, other piece of, so when you invest more, you create jobs. When you invest more, you have more exports. And the combination of jobs and exports creates demand. Anticipating that demand, firms invest a lot more. And that's how this virtuous cycle proceeds. That is the essence of the key idea in the, in the economic survey. Okay. Uh, let me see. How are we doing with time? How much? How much? 20 more minutes? Okay, so now let me actually talk about, so just, and this is something which is important, what are the two key departures we've made from traditional Anglo-Saxon thinking? And, and this is something that I, having, you know, studied there and, and having taught, taught in the US as well, and then having lived now in India for 10 years, what I, re re you know, recognize is that it is important to actually learn the careful thinking that you know that that you get taught by you know in the, in uh, by by following the research in the united states but what is also important is to calibrate it to the indian reality um, and that is the that is the key point here so we are making two departures this is what is called the economics of equilibrium you know those of you who who understand you know uh, who had a little bit of exposure to economics equilibrium is something that is very very key to to economics and think about equilibrium in this following manner. Take a glass bowl and put a marble, kanchi, you know what we say in Hindi, kanchi, right? So put a kanchi there, you know, a marble. What happens? That marble will barely oscillate and then come down and actually settle at the bottom, right? It stays in that equilibrium. Even if you push it up, it'll come back and actually stay there. That is what is called an equilibrium. In other words, you know, the economics has focused a lot on that equilibrium phenomenon but not enough on the process of how it basically oscillates and remains outside equilibrium. But my training as an engineer, you know, as an engineer, some, we don't emphasize as much on equilibrium. We also talk about a lot of, you know, basically getting into that equilibrium, getting out of equilibrium, and that's one key departure we've made because as I described earlier, earlier economies are either in a virtuous cycle 
or in a vicious cycle. They're not in an equilibrium. They're basically either sort of things are building up and really you're going on a virtuous cycle or, or you're in a vicious cycle. So that's a key departure that we've made from the traditional you know, thinking from you know, the Anglo-Saxon thinking. The other important part is actually also what, what you know, um, so in electrical engineering we used, you know, I, I remember this course called control systems. So where we basically used to think about, you know, as systems rather than as, as components. And, and that is, you know, for a complex system as an economy, it's also important to have the same system thinking rather than just thinking about it in parts. And that's what this particular virtuous cycle that I showed you, you know, focuses on. Rather than trying to solve five, six different problems, which is, you know, how do I enhance productivity? How do I enhance exports? How do I in increase jobs? How do I increase demand? How do I increase saving? How do I increase investment? Asking those six, seven different problems, instead recognize that they actually are parts of an interlinked system. And that if you actually you know, increase investment, then investment itself will increase productivity, which will increase exports and jobs which will create demand and thereby you know, lead to more investment. So focus has to therefore be on investment rather than solving multiple problems. It is basically the system perspective saying let's focus on investment and that's another key departure that is being made in this saying you know, the economies of, economics of silos, thinking about them as silos has basically been, you know, that's, that's another key departure that we've done. Better to understand them as a system, either in a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle. So, to summarize what I've said so far, in order for the economy, whether it's actually at the state level, you know, with Gujarat, Maharashtra, any state, or at the national level, in order for us to be able to achieve that growth rate of, of basically, you know, close to close to 8%, we have to be focusing on investment. And, and if you notice, therefore, the, the party of this budget speech focused substantially on investment, on, you know, on, on infrastructure investment and overall investment, startups, etc. And that is why, that is, that is quite critical too. Now, let, I actually want to also talk about the importance of demography in this particular, in this, um, if you notice here in the earlier chart, the demograph, favorable demographics is like a catalyst to this cycle. And, and that is something which I want to spend some time on. Uh, there's now, you know, a uh, lot of research on other economies which shows, so this set of charts on the left is for China. And these charts are for other East Asian economies. So you have Indonesia, Korea, Malaysia, and Thailand. Notice for China first, from 19, from the, I think this is being shown from 1980 onwards till 2015-16, the proportion of the working population. So if you take 100 people in China, what you know what percentage of that was basically working pe people in the working age that increased significantly over this period. Importantly, what did that do? That increased the savings rate a lot as well. Why does this happen? It's a, you know, it's very intuitive. If you reflect back on each one of you, you know, you, when you are in your 20s and 30s, you know, you, you want to basically go and consume. You want to, you know, whether it's actually new, new, new dresses or new, you know, new sets of uh, maybe a phone or whatever you want to consume. Once you start hitting your 40s, then you start thinking that, oh, maybe I should start saving for retirement now. And that actually, in fact, you know, in the, in the data as well, it's seen very clearly that the percentage of the population that is in the 40 plus age, when that increases, savings rate in the economy increases. The other important driver of demographics is, think about basically, you know, our, our grandfathers and grandmothers. Many of them, you know, our fathers, for instance, might, most likely might have had six, seven siblings, right? Many of them, six, seven, many, you know, our, our grandparents actually, many of them had lots of kids. So when they were, and they wouldn't have thought as much about saving for old age. Why? Because saying, are mere saath bete hain, koi na tu, koi to, koi na koi to meko dekhi lega, right? You know, somebody will, you know, I don't have to worry, ya saath bete, saath beti hain, you know, some, koi, koi to dekhi lega. But today, if we think about it, we have basically, you know, so, you know, hum do, hamare do wala concept. Then you start worrying, you know, what if, you know, dono, if both of them, suppose for instance, both of them end up going to the, to the United States, let's say, or live, live abroad, then, you know, I have to take care of myself, right? So what this is, in economics, this is called as the dependency ratio, which is, you know, the number of children that we have that you can depend on for old age. That dependency ratio, when it decreases, 
anticipating that what people do is to save more saying you know i have only one kid or maybe two kids and if you have one kid some may maybe you know i'm just sort of mentioning this jocularly saying you know are beta hai maybe die nahi to bahu kya kara jaye fir actually you know i <laughs> so you know to ghar se bahar nikal legi to hum apne you know we have to actually be self dependent right so you you save a lot more so the combination of you know one the increase in the in the in the life cycle age the other important part is if you were you know if you know that you're going to they say the average age or li life expectancy expectancy is 65 years right then you in your 40s you know that you have to save for another maybe after retirement for maybe 10 12 years but if you if you know that you are you are going to be alive till 80 then you have to save for close to 20 years so obviously you will save more so the combination of the you know of of increase in life expectancy the decrease in the number of children that 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 you know families are having and the increase in the working age population itself all three contribute to savings and that's what happened in china happened in other asian economies as well and will happen in india as well provided we basically create enough well paying jobs for the for 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 the population and that's what i that i've already covered as you noticed through investments actually leading to jobs so when you create actually jobs and you know for for the working age population and we do have a you know large working age population that will further invest for the further savings which will then enable enable investment that's why the favorable demographics is actually an important cost you know important element in this particular hope i'm actually you know hope i'm not being too technical i mean you know are people understanding the bro broad ideas right of often times actually economics can can really get sort of muddled in jargon and you know uh, that, that that's not i mean if you're here and i can't explain to you what the idea is then actually i'm not doing my job as a professor <laughs> okay so this is sort of the 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 important um the other important um, chapter which we i think um, hopefully can can make an impact is the you know use of behavioral economics um now and that's why we've actually chose this term homo sapiens versus homo economicus uh, is interesting when you learn economics for the first time and maybe this is as an engineer when i went and learned economics you know start thinking that the person who's modeled in that is actually is like a robot right you know if he sets an alarm to get up at 6:30 he will never put it on you know on um, put it on basically snooze and go to sleep he will wake up at 6:30 like a you know complete somebody who follows all plans and like a perfect you know individual homo economicus but that's not what humans are we humans actually have our idiosyncrasies things like we actually have inertia you know um, so th there's there's a lot of evidence and I'm, some some part of it i'll i'll show a simple thing of just changing the default so in the context of savings other countries have shown that if you change the default from let's say you know you having to send a form to save a little bit more in your ppf like in, in your provident fund you have to sign in a form and say you know save i want to save 2% more from my salary versus if they say by default you know we will save 2% more from your salary but if you don't want to save just send in a form saying i don't want to save that much as a result you are not basically robbing you're keeping the same choices that you know people are not being constrained from their choices that simple thing of just changing the default enhances savings a lot why because you know most of us think we have this saying and i keep one of the one of the things i actually tell keep telling my kids is when they if if you know if i tell them to study and they'll you know they'll say you know tomorrow then i said tomorrow never comes why because when you are in tomorrow again you say tomorrow and that is something which is characteristic of all of us we say same you know while i tell my kids this but i am as guilty of doing the same thing you know when i think about well maybe going for a jog sometimes i'll do tomorrow and when tomorrow comes again tomorrow and this is basically what happens with with most of us we have this inertia and keep pushing things that's why changing the default option can make a big difference and take us out of our inertia and and just sort of taps into some of the so what has happened is i think over the last 20 years has been tremendous amount of research in this area and which culminated in the nobel prize being given to professor richard taylor in 2017 i was privileged to actually learn behavioral economics from him so so i actually felt that especially in an economy in a country like india 
where our behavior is so much affected by our social and cultural norms. You know, the potential for, for, for behavioral change is enormous because, you know, by just changing those norms, actually, you know, in a, in a good way, not in a, not in a bad way, in a sort of paternalistic way, behavioral change can really be achieved. And I think the best example of that is the Swachh Bharat mission. Uh, so notice this basically, you know, I, I remember when the Prime Minister spoke about the, um, the, about the Swachh Bharat mission, you know, from the ramparts to the Red Fort in 2014, there were a lot of critics who were saying, you know, why is he talking about toilets from in his first speech from the, you know, from the ramp ramparts to the Red Fort? Why? Because basically people say, this, this is not possible, right? This is just a kitabi idea, you know. And that is something which I want to mention that every I transformational, you know, change begins with an idea. And when the, the, the more path breaking the idea, the greater number of skeptics who basically will say this idea is not, not, you know, in fact, one way to measure the quality of an idea is how many people who are opposing that idea. Uh, <laughs> not, not to say that that is the only benchmark, but that's one way of, um, so take a look here, you know, this is what we've shown is the coverage of individual household latrines in 2015-16 versus 2018-19. So you see a lot of red patches there. Red, red corresponds to less coverage, and green corresponds to more coverage. So you notice in 2015-16 that there has been a lot of, you know, there were a lot of, you know, uh, states and districts which had low coverage. In come 2018-19, you see that it has become very green, right? You know, most most districts have now close to 100% coverage, but. A usual criticism that is, that, is, that is made is, oh, you know, we have built toilets, but nobody uses them. That's sort of a criticism that is, that, that is made. I'll come to that just in a minute. But also look at the open defecation free villages, the change there from 2015-16 to 2018-19, significant change. Now, what is the best way to go and check whether sanitation has really improved? Go and look at health outcomes. Because the first difference that sanitation makes is on health outcomes. If indeed people are using, you know, more people are using the, let's say, the, the, the toilets, sanitation has thereby improved, it should show up in health outcomes. Now, if I asked you, let's say, I, I'm, I'm in 2015-16, I show you this particular chart. And I ask you now, where would I see the greater improvements in health outcomes? Many, you know, most of you will say in the red areas, because if you are able to in, indeed increase coverage up to 100%, the improvement in health outcomes should come the maximum in the red areas. Yes? The light green areas also can have, there can be improvement because they can become dark green. There is, but the bigger improvement should happen in the red areas. This is exactly what we went and tested in the, you know, in, in, the, in the survey. What we did was we took the coverage of the, the individual household latrine as of 2015-16 and said these are the set of districts where coverage was very low and this is the set of districts where coverage was, was high. And said, okay, now let's go and look at the, some health outcomes in this set of villages versus this set of villages. The high coverage in 2015-16, which is this set, versus the low coverage. And look at the before after, what happens in before after. And that is exactly what I have here in this particular chart. This set is, you know, is basically red. That's your, that's your light green here, it's being visible, I think, in blue for some reason. Notice, this is basically, as of 2015, the instances of, of diarrhea for children under five years. This is before for those districts where the coverage was low. Remember, this is your, those, those red ones, red ones, right? And this is as of March 2019. So this is 2015, March 2015, that's March 2019. Look at that, that, that difference. Now, the green, light green areas have also shown improvement but not as much as the red areas. This is what we call in Hindi, dood ka dood, pani ka pani ho gaya. Right? That the evidence clearly shows, and now it is not just for, for diarrhea cases for children under five years, also look at malaria cases for children under five years, same kind of impact, in fact, even, even more pronounced. This is your, 
where coverage was low, coverage was, was, was high, stillbirths, children being born without life, stillbirths. That has again impact is greater in the, you know, where, where, the, where IHHL coverage was, was low and underweight newborns because if the mother is not healthy, you know, likely that the child will actually be born, you know, with, with uh, underweight, that also the same impact. So the best evidence to basically say is first, if sanitation improves and indeed there has been behavioral change in sanitation, it should show up in health outcomes. Go and check the health outcomes in basically those districts which were actually, you know, the red versus the green and lo and behold, you find that indeed this has made an impact. And this is sort of the evidence of behavioral change that the Swachh Bharat mission has brought in and which basically gives us therefore the confidence that if we can do it with the Swachh Bharat mission, by the way, you know, before this in 2014, India was the open defecation capital of the world. Now we basically have, you know, we sort of indeed brought in, brought in, you know, tr uh, transformational change uh, in, in, in this particular aspect. Similarly, look at the, the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao Abhiyan, which was, you know, for, so this, I mean, if you, I don't know, you know, notice this, but this selfie with daughter campaign became quite a viral one uh, because what did, it tapped into a simple emotion of the father saying that I am proud of my daughter, you know, my daughter is not a liability because I have to give her dahej or whatever. I am proud of my daughter and that is what the selfie with the daughter campaign really acknowledged and, and you know, see basically the sex ratio improvements at, at, at birth. So using this, what we've tried to do is that there are seven core principles or basically what I think about as seven sutras, seven sutras for, you know, for, for, for uh, implementing behavioral change which is leverage default rules. I already gave you that example of default. Do you have a default where you opt in to, you know, to savings or it's an opt out from savings? That changing that default can make a difference. It has been applied very well in many areas. For instance, to give you an example, Austria and Germany, two countries that, you know, are contiguous to each other, same kind of culture. Um, in Germany, Organ donation is, you know, you have to actually sign in a form to say, you know, if I want to donate my organs, you have to sign in a form. In Austria, if you do not want to donate your organs, you have to sign in a form and send that, send that form in. What is the, the difference in the organ donation ratios? Germany is about 6% and in Austria it's about close to 70%. So just by changing that default, so much, you know, because again, think about it. Why? Because just simple human characteristics, which is saying that, you know, Are, abhi to mujhe jina hai, yaar. you know, kal karunga main. Kal, kal form bhar dunga, right? You know, I'll do it tomorrow. So, so uh, you know, that just by tapping into that default, you know, you can make a big difference. And this is about you know, understanding human behavior. And behavioral economics is basically a combination of psychology and economics, both of which have come together to really, um, Similarly, make it easy to choose uh, for people. Emphasize social norms. You know, this is, there, there's a box that we've included in the survey. Those of you who are interested should go and read, which is, you know, in, in the, in, you know, if you look at our scriptures, gender equality has been something that has been really, really respected. There is a saying in, in Sanskrit which goes as, yatra pujyate nari tatra ramante devataha. Yatra pujyate nari, nari women, right? Yatra pujyate, where you actually respect women, tatra, there, ramante, stay, devataha, which is basically the, 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 the gods. And these are the kind of, you know, similarly the concept of, you know, Ardhanarishwara, which is, which all of us grow up with, you know, you know, Shiva and Parvati as basically manifestation of the, of the Shakti and, and, and Shiva and Shakti together. And, and even if you look at the way the names, right, you know, if, if do we basically, have you ever seen a name called, which basically goes as Narayan Lakshmi? You would have heard a lot of people having names Lakshmi Narayan, but you've never heard the name Narayan Lakshmi. Similarly, I'm sure you've never encountered the name of a person as Shankar Uma. You would have heard, you would have seen lots of names Uma Shankar, right? These, now, these are simple, but you know, such profound things that we actually have that similarly, you know, Radha Gopal, not Gopal Radha, right? Um, these are ways in which, you know, um, that, that even, even for instance, you know, if you look at mo a lot of names where actually of gods are based on their mother's name, Devaki Nandan, right? You know, 
Deviki Nam, basically the ch child of Deviki, Deviki Nandan. So that's, these are powerful messages. Why? Because some of us who are educated may say, ah, why is he talking about religion, etc. But for the peep, for the common person, this makes a huge difference because he or she identifies with this. That's part of our culture. We actually grow with it, you know, when we are, and that's something I used to remark, you know, when we were, for instance, in the, when, when we lived in the United States for 10 years, you know, every, every Sunday we used to go to this Chinmaya Missions Bal Vihar, where, you know, take our kids there for Bal Vihar. Now, after we moved back here, we basically, you know, we didn't go to Bal Vihar. We didn't have to because the fact that the children are here, you know, they end up picking up just in the environment itself. When you are in another country, you have to actually make that effort to imbibe the culture, you know, in another country. But when you are in India, they just pick it up from the environment. We basically learn these, you know, these things. I, I learned it when I actually was a kid. And that's the, that's the power of the social norm, the power of, you know, of, of basically the, you know, the, the ethos that we've been built. And that's why the, the potential for behavioral change is significant in India. Similarly, you know, one of the other um, ideas that we basically have talked about in the survey is, you know, to relates to tax evasion and, and, and willful default. So there is, you know, in, in the, in, in, uh, across religions, there is this idea of actually, if you, if you have debt, right, if you do not repay your debt during, in your lifetime itself, that's a sin, as a sinner. So in, in the, you know, in the Hindu code, there is a doctrine called the doctrine of moral obligation, which is the doctrine of moral obligation basically states that if a, if a person, if a parent dies with debt, then it is beholden on the child to be repaying that debt because it is basically said, in, and you know, this is, uh, you know, th there, are, there are saints who have actually written about this, saying that the, the atma goes, wherever it goes, basically suffers because of actually the sin of not having repaid the debt. It's, and this is not characteristic only to the Hindu religion. You know, even in, in, in Islam, for instance, b when a person dies, they actually come with, to all the people who have come to pay their last respects, they come around with a container containing notes. Say that, you know, if this person borrowed some money from you, please take it now, so that his, last, his or her last journey can be without any debts. And, you know, similarly, go and read the Bible as well. There as well, you know, the, 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 it's mentioned about how, you know, b having debts is basically a sin. Now, whether it's debt to the, to the, to the, to the government or debts to the bank, debt is debt. And, and, and that is, you know, if you do not pay that, it's a sin. And, and that is something which we basically have to talk about. In, you know, it, it, this may not work very well in the Western society because they don't even, they don't believe in rebirth, they don't believe in, you know, in soul, etc. But here in India, we do. And that is why this, it's something which is important to, to um, you know, to sort of use this. By the way, I've always wondered, you know, when, whenever I've had this discussion, it's a sort of a, I'm going to take a detour on this, which is whenever I used to have debates with my, with my foreign friends on, on rebirth and, and soul, etc. I would ask them one simple question for which I never got an answer. One of the, one of the fundamental you know, theories of, of physics is the law of conservation of energy. That energy can neither be destroyed nor can be created, right? And one of the other things is kinetic energy and potential energy, right? Now, take someone, you know, take, take basically uh, the, that, that that eternally, you know, blessed soul, APJ Abdul Kalam. He was lecturing like this. When you're lecturing, you're using kinetic energy, I'm moving your hands. And then, you know, in, in, in a, I mean, karma yogi basically died while, while lecturing, right? So there is energy now in that person. Uh, once, once the person is dead, no energy now. Where is the energy gone? Energy cannot be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed. And so all that has happened is kinetic energy has gotten transformed into potential energy. Potential energy. Now, if basically their energy cannot be destroyed, then there has to be actually the concept of, you know, that you are basically beyond life as well. And that's, this is something I'm not saying it. This is Swami Vivekananda writing about this, you know, many, 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 many years back. And, and these are the kind of now concepts that come naturally to us. And that is why we need to be tapping into it when we actually to bring about behavioral change in, in the, you know, in the, because finally, as I say, there's a saying, boond boond se sagar bharta hai, right? Each boond, each one of us coming together, that's how we basically can really, so that's the, that's the sort of the idea and what, you know, this is something, there's this an idea that, that was given by the, 
by, by the PM himself. To any, when he looked at these seven principles, he said, why don't you associate it with the seven sins that Gandhiji talked about, which is politics without principle, wealth without work, pleasure without consci conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice. And these are what we basically need to, that's, um, you know, principles that, that need to be, uh, you know, utilized in our own lives in order to bring about this, this behavioral change. So that's sort of the, the, the chapter in the, in the second, chap second chapter in volume, of, volume one of the survey lays out an aspirational agenda for bringing about social change from, you know, beti bachao, beti padhao to what we've coined as badla, which is beti aapki, dhan lakshmi or vijay lakshmi. You know, because that, that concept of lakshmi is basically when, when you know, when uh, my daughter was born, I remember my father saying, you know, lakshmi ghar hai. And that's the way we basically think about it. And, and these are things that we need to tap into. Similarly, the Swachh Bharat mission from going from there to a Swast and Sundar Bharat, you know, by tapping into principles of behavioral economics. From the give it up LPG, which was, you know, one of the, one of the sort of the path breaking ideas to give up your subsidy, of, albeit in the context of LPG, to going about thinking about the subsidy. Because remember, money does not grow on trees, whether it actually is for households or for the country. If people like us who actually are well to do, if we take a hundred rupee subsidy, effectively that subsidy, that hundred rupees is being, you know, deprived to someone more deserving. And, and that is a thought that we basically need to have. Therefore, you know, we need to be thinking about whether it's actually the railway con concession that we take for our, for our parents, basically the old age, you know, uh, senior citizen, which people like us don't need to actually take that. Um, or any other subsidy, we need to be thinking about the subsidy so that the money that we basically, we don't deserve it, we don't, or we don't need it. B better, you know, there are more people who actually, the, who, who deserve that. So think about the subsidy and that's the way, um, that, 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 that's the only way in which actually subsidy rationalization can happen. Similarly, going from tax evasion to tax compliance. So these are sort of the big, you know, um, areas that the chapter on behavioral change, behavioral economics, you know, uh, talks about. So to, to basically, I, I'm going to just, you know, uh, in the interest of time, for, you know, try and quickly conclude. Um, the economic survey, you know, paints us uh, or, or tries to lay out a strategic blueprint for the economy at five trillion by, you know, talks about shifting gears through a virtuous cycle with investment as the key driver um, and, and behavioral economics for path breaking change. There is some ideas about, you know, about MSMEs if we, uh, maybe in question and answer I could actually take talk about some of that which is, you know, on, uh, thanks a lot for your patience. Um, hearing economics for an hour is actually not easy. So I congratulate you for, uh, I think uh, we have reached the end of the program. Uh, uh, due to time constraint, we need to, I am extremely sorry. And uh, <clears throat> let me continue with the vote of thanks. I'll be even as brief so that it doesn't feel that uh, the others lost out and I spoke a little more. I think today's talk has been extremely enlightening as well as energizing. It has all motivated us towards being contributors to take India to the next step, that is to the 5 trillion economy. There have been quantitative aspects, qualitative aspects. On the quantitative side, it talks about investments going into productivity to job exports and demand and the cycle goes on. And on the qualitative aspects, which show that uh, <coughs> To take the economy to the 5 trillion, we need to look at the behavioral changes in our society because that's those are going to be, in fact, bigger contributors towards taking it further. With that, I thank Dr. Subramanian for giving us such a enlightening talk. It has kept all of us gripped uh, uh, continuously as well as uh, a special thanks to the Chief Commissioner, Mr. Merotra, for making this impromptu visit today over here. Him being here has added value to the whole event. Uh, with this, I would like to offer a memento to our guests.
I invite uh, Mr. Merotra to give a token to our chief guest on behalf of the income tax department. Good evening and have a nice evening. Thank you.